My name is Steve Jose and I'm one of the uh, local physicians here at Santa Barbara Cottage Hospital and my specialty is a uh, practice of infectious diseases. Uh, I would like to begin with, as usual, declaring that I don't have anything uh, that I need to declare uh, in terms of being paid or uh, connections with anyone. Uh, and I also need to declare that the uh, opinions uh, and what I'm stating here uh, today really are my own and uh, are not necessarily those of Cottage Hospital or the uh, Graduate Medical Education Program. So I um, am a new person to this uh, struggle. And four weeks ago, uh, I knew little or nothing about what was going on at uh, Fukushima. It was just about four weeks ago that um, I was going to the county bowl with a group of friends and as usual we get together and have uh, a meal before going to the uh, county bowl. And uh, one of the uh, friends that uh, attends, who's actually an ER physician, had just gotten some bluefin tuna that a friend of his had caught off the coast of San Diego. And we had an absolutely delicious meal. We barbecued it and um, it was one of the better meals I've ever had. Then. Uh, I just happened to be uh, in attendance at one of the uh, United Nations Association of Santa Barbara meetings. In fact, it was the first meeting that was there. And someone casually mentioned that, uh, of course, everyone knew that the uh, bluefin tuna was carrying radioactivity from Fukushima. Now, I was sitting in a place where no one could see me, <laughs> which was probably just as well, because I had a visceral um, gag reflex because I realized what had happened and that I had literally exposed myself in a very significant way anyway uh, to a, a potential danger and I didn't really know what that meant and I, I, I must say I've spent much of my professional life paying attention to those sorts of things that uh, people need to be warned about, whether that be uh, HIV infection or swine influenza or SARS or the Middle Eastern respiratory virus. Um, I can find out that information readily and quickly. In fact, I could get on my iPhone right now and I could tell you exactly how many cases there were of the Middle Eastern respiratory virus syndrome and how many deaths had been a result of that. I don't have quite the access to the same sort of information about Fukushima. And so this got my attention and I thought, well, geez, I need to find out something about this. And it has been a whirlwind tour since that time. So what I'm going to do is walk you through sort of a brief chronology of what little I know about this. And I do not claim to be an expert, but I claim to be um, a citizen of the world who uh, needs to know and wants to know uh, about this information. So this is the uh, Fukushima Daiichi uh, plant and uh, Daiichi means number one. It's a multi-reactor nuclear power site in the Fukushima prefecture of Japan. And you can see here that these are the uh, unit one, two, three, four, five and six are over here. And I want you to pay attention to all this open area here behind the plants. And of course, this is on the ocean and you can see water exiting, which is used for cooling uh, the reactors. Well, the perfect storm happened on Friday, March 11th, 2011. This is now referred to as 311 or 311 um, for obvious reasons or hopefully reasons that will become obvious anyway. At 1446, there was a 9.0 earthquake off the coast of Hosho Island, that's the biggest island of Japan, which cut off the power plant from Japanese electricity grid. At that time, uh, reactors one, two, and three automatically shut down as they are supposed to do. That's exactly what's supposed to happen when the electricity uh, uh, cuts off or there's an earthquake. At 1527, the first tsunami strikes the plant. Now I learned a really important piece of information here, and that is that there is a small wave that comes before the big wave. 
and there were several people who died because after the first wave, they went down to check on people who'd been there for the first wave, and they were swept away with the second wave. So should something like this happen on our coast? And, you know, we just have to be aware about how we prepare for these possibilities. Don't go down after the first wave because there's likely a bigger second wave that's coming. Then at 1546, about 20 minutes later, there was a 14 meter, which is a 46 foot tsunami that was unleashed by the earthquake over top the seawall designed to protect the plant from a tsunami of 5.7 meters or 19 feet, disabling the backup generators that are now underwater. So in this perfect storm, the electricity has been shut off from the reactors, it's been shut off from the grid, and it's now shut off from the backup diesel generators. There were some backup batteries that were available, but they only last about four to six hours. Those are provided an attempt to hopefully provide uh, other electrical backup to keep the pumps running. Well, boiling water reactors, which is what this nuclear reactor was, the key with these boiling water reactors is that they always need to have water in the reactor and the water being circulated in order to keep the fuel rods cool because one of the ways that you control the nuclear reaction is by what the temperature is. Anytime you keep, increase the temperature of anything, it makes it go faster, speed things up. At Fukushima, the earthquake triggered the shutdown, stopped, by the, stopped the electricity from being made by the reactor. It was also disrupted from the power grid. And the diesel generators, re, generators flooded and failed, and the backup batteries only worked for a few hours. This is um, an illustration, again, of where the units are at Fukushima. Uh, on some level, we thought it was fortunate that Reactor 4, 5, and 6 had been shut down. 4 had recently been shut down, and all the active fuel rods had actually been taken out of the reactor and placed in the spent fuel uh, pond. 1, 2, and 3 were still active. Uh, this is what the reactor looks like, and what happens here, these are the uh, radioactive core where the reaction occurs. These are the fuel rods, these are the control rods, which are, consist of primarily boron or carbon, and what these do is these absorb the neutrons, which are what is responsible for keeping the chain reaction going. The other way that the reaction is controlled by the temperature of the water, which is circulating continuously in here. Now, what happens when you have a nuclear reaction, you make a lot of heat. And when you make a lot of heat, that takes this water and makes it boil. The steam comes out here and goes through these turbines, and the steam spins the turbines, and then you make electricity. And that's how you generate electricity. What you can see is its temperature as this condenses through the turbine. This is cooled by water that comes in from the outside. This is ocean water that comes in, is heated, and then put back out into the bay after that. The eyes of the world are on the Fukushima Daiichi plant. But just what went wrong there? Let's look. The plant has six reactors, and ordinarily they use heat from their uranium fuel rods to boil water, to spin turbines, and make electricity. The water helps cool the fuel rods. They're sealed in a reactor vessel, which is sealed in a containment vessel, which is housed in a larger building, all made of steel and concrete. But when the earthquake struck, power to pump in the cooling water failed, and backup generators failed too. Battery power kicked in, but at least two of the reactors were damaged enough that gas escaped, creating the explosions we saw. The Japanese government insisted those inner walls held well enough that even if the fuel rods were not cooled, even if they melted into radioactive lava, they would be contained in the bottom of the reactor and there would not be a meltdown into the ground. But with radiation escaping into the air, others say we've been reminded that we're playing with fire. And modern ABC, you know. So what essentially happened was a meltdown that occurred in the reactor here. And it was hoped that when this meltdown occurred, this essentially turns into lava. And you have these, this uh, containment vessel, uh, reactor vessel here, which keeps all the radioactivity and all the power inside of here. The problem is, as this 
reaction continues, more and more heat is generated, more and more reaction occurs, and you actually get this material melting down through this large concrete and steel containers here. It is now thought that this molten mass times three has broken through here and now is in the ground and uh, contaminating the, the water table under this area. Well, this is what happens in a nuclear reaction. And you can see the uranium-235, which is basically unstable to begin with. That's what it means, it's radioactive. It breaks down, and when it breaks down, it releases tremendous amounts of energy in the form of heat. And as you can see, the, this reaction and the protons, which are released from this reaction, can be controlled by the moderators, and that moderator is the water and the temperature of the water, but it also can be controlled by the control rods, which are put inside here and absorb the neutrons also, which keep the reaction from going and exploding in an uncontrollable fashion. Now, this heat is radiation, and the radiation comes out in the form of alpha, beta, and gamma rays. These different rays have lots of energy associated with them. Some of them can't penetrate paper, some of them can penetrate just about anything. So this radiation in high levels can kill you instantaneously. It can cause you to vaporize because there is so much energy that's released in this situation. In other situations, if you ingest it, then it gets into your body and this radiation is chronically being released inside your body. We'll come back to what that means uh, in a little bit. Nuclear power is one hell of a way to boil water, Albert Einstein. How prophetic was that? And I will come back to that later as well. So at unit one, the fuel rods melted down in about five hours. Molten fuel breached and melted through the reactor pressure vessel. Meltdowns in units two and three uh, occurred subsequently. As a result of the heating up of the water, the water actually reacted with the uh, zircaloy coverings that the fuel rods were in. The fuel rods are about the, the size of my thumb and they're about 12 to 15 feet long. Uh, they're bundled together, but as the heat goes up, the water actually reacts with that zircaloy that's on the outside of it and it makes hydrogen gas. The hydrogen gas pressure builds up and then actually explodes and hydrogen air did blast from reactors one, three, and four. There was some concern at that time that the spent fuel pools outside the reactors were at risk of meltdown. There were several Japanese workers who lost their lives trying to save us from this. And they actually did a very good job of controlling things at that point in time. So a meltdown is a severe uncontrolled overheating of a nuclear reactor core resulting in melting of the core and release of massive amounts of energy. And of course you can see the result of that with the uh, atomic bomb that's there. When this meltdown occurs inside of the reactor, all the concrete and steel contains most of the radiation and most of the heat so it doesn't cause a blast like you see here. So that's a key piece of information as we go along. So this is what the uh, site looked like after the um, um, earthquake uh, and tsunami occurred. And you can see down here in the front, these are the turbines that had been uh, creating the uh, electricity. This is what uh, Unit 3 and Unit 4 looked like um, after these explosions uh, had occurred. And again, this is the, uh, the plant here, and you can see some vets vestige of the nuclear reactors that are there. This is unit four here, and it looks like there's significant damage. You can see structurally it's barely standing. As of this time, it's actually listing about 31 inches to one side, and there's so much water that's in the ground, it's actually sinking into the ground, even as we speak. This is the fire that occurred, releasing tons of radioactive gas into the atmosphere. For the Japanese sake, fortunately, the wind was blowing north and east. Great for the Japanese, not so great if you live in Santa Barbara. This is how the nuclear fallout map looked over three, six, and ten days, and you can see 
As you get farther away from the site, the amount of radiation decreases significantly, but certainly is present along the west coast. And this is just the gases that occurred from release at that particular day and time. So back to the uh, site, and this is a schematic of what the site looks like. And these are the um, reactor buildings uh, that are still standing. This is the aquifer with the water flowing underneath this area directly into the ocean. As a result of the cut, cut off of all the water that was cooling, there was no circulation, there was nothing to keep it cool, they had to take water from the ocean and put into the reactor buildings. That water now is circulating intimately with the radioactive material that's there, so when it comes out, it is highly radioactive. So what are you going to do with that? So what has been attempted to be done, there have been a thousand storage tanks, these temporary storage tanks here, each containing large amounts of radioactive water, put together hastily, leaking continuously. Where does it, what happens when this radiation leaks? It goes down here into the water and into the aquifer and out into the ocean. For two and a half years, this has been occurring. Two and a half years this has been occurring. After the typhoon that was recently present there, some of the radioactivity outside of some of these uh, storage areas went up 6,500 times. That's a lot of radiation for anyone, anywhere. And where does it go once it got out? Gets down into the water and out into the ocean. Here is another look at the uh, Daiichi plant, and I just want to call your attention to all of these that were not there in the previous example. And what are these? These are the storage tanks, hastily built, but leaking continuously. And where does that water go? Down into the aquifer or out into the ocean. So there are about 100 tons per day that comes into the reactors to try and keep them cool. And again, the problem is keeping them cool, we don't even know where this molten lava is. It may be down here, and many experts think it is actually down here in the ground, burrowing down into the ground. There was a movie made about this many years ago called The China Syndrome. Well, this may be coming more in our direction than towards China. Um, this is also 400 tons of water come underneath the, the reactor site and into the ocean every day, and this is being contaminated from the reactors as well as from the storage uh, banks that are there. So what do we know? We know that radioactive water continues to flow into the Pacific Ocean unabated. We know that the levels of radioactivity in the ocean around Fukushima have remained relatively constant as has the contamination of the fish. Well, what does this tell you? You're in steady state even though you're in contact with the ocean, and yes, there is some dilution that's occurring as the radioactive water moves eastward again, we're maintaining the same concentration of radioactivity there, which means it's still being soiled with the amount of radioactivity that's coming in. So it's not a steady state situation, it's one that's continually increasing as the Pacific Ocean is being soiled with radioactive water. This is some of the um, uh, currents that are present uh, in the Pacific. And as you can see, there's clearly a straight shot up here to Alaska and the Northern Pacific. And of course, here we are again, uh, waiting with open arms to greet this. It is said, there are estimates, that the radioactive plume which is coming from here will reach uh, California somewhere between, in, between in early 2014 and 2015. What that means? remains to be determined. This is actually um, a map showing uh, the radioactive seawater impact map, and this is designed from both putting radioactive water into the uh, currents and seeing where it goes, and also some uh, superficial uh, uh, bobbers to uh, find out which way the uh, currents are carrying uh, things. So it's about halfway across uh, the Pacific Ocean at this time. Well, what are some of the other observations that have been made? Because once you start getting involved in this, sometimes it reaches the stage of paranoia. But when you see all of these things occurring 
as is the old adage, where there's smoke, there's fire, you begin to wonder what the correlation is. One of the da most dangerous things we can do in medicine is make temporal correlations with observations. So here are some of the observations that have been made. Not all of the observations, but some of them anyway. The uh, British Columbia sardine fishery uh, collapse, uh, they don't have any sardines up in the Pacific Northwest right now. The sardine uh, industry has co collapsed completely. The uh, finding heron up there that have uh, hemorrhaging uh, from their gills, from their eyes, uh, from their bodies. They do not understand where this is coming from or why this is happening. This certainly began to happen uh, after the um, um, March 2011. The um, northern whales are well known for singing and they can be heard very easily up in uh, the northern waters uh, in the Pacific Northwest. They have been quiet. There's been speculation about why this is occurring. Usually they chat with one another, presumably to let others know where the food is. It's also difficult when you go whale watching up there now to actually find whales. In fact, several times people have been skunked when they've gone out, uh, not by skunks anyway, they haven't been able to see any uh, uh, whales when they go out whale watching because they're so far out uh, in the ocean because apparently there's not much for them to feed on in, clo in more closely. These are uh, another mystery which has occurred. The uh, sunflower starfish are basically disintegrating and there's actually a, a video, an underwater video um, that's on the internet where a diver is swimming along and you can just see um, that these arms of these creatures have fallen off. This is what a normal one looks like. These things are huge. They can have as many as 24 legs on them, and they eat anything and everything because nothing gets in their way anyway. But this is what they look like as they're falling apart up there. Very mysterious that this is occurring. I tell you this as a note of caution because this is not only happening on the West Coast, but also the East Coast. But it's also happened back in the early 90s as well. So we can't necessarily say jump to the conclusion this is necessarily radiation that's causing this. But it's an observation that's been made and what we deserve to know is what is the association and what is going on up there and why isn't anybody talking about this? Why isn't it being reported? Why are we not hearing about this? And then we come back to my, one of my favorite dinners, the bluefin tuna. and. Um, the bluefin tuna, there was a study done in uh, 2011 that showed that 15 of the 15 bluefin tuna caught all had excessive amounts of radioactive cesium-134 and 137 uh, in them. Uh, everyone was surprised about this uh, and, and the conclusion was that they had packaged this up and brought it all the way to us uh, on the west coast. Now, most of the information about this is interesting studies that are being done on migratory patterns because the cesium-134 has a relatively short half-life of about two years. That means it takes two years for 50% of it to go away. The cesium-137, on the other hand, takes about 30 years for half of it to go away. So you can do some uh, mathematical modeling and find out when they were actually exposed and, of course, where were they exposed. There's no cesium-134, 137 naturally in the ocean, but certainly they got exposed uh, at Fukushima. This is the actual study that was in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences uh, which explained this and they were very proud about being able to use this to determine the migratory patterns of the uh, Pacific uh, bluefin tuna. And they also noted that the uh, amount of radiation that they was there was significantly above the background radiation that was there. The background radiation was there that surprised me more than anything because where did that background radiation come? Why should fish have radiation in them, in them anyway? Well, it had to do with a lot of the nuclear testing that was done and previous bombs that had been dropped. Because remember, the half-life of these things is up to 30 years. So it's still there from previous exposure in our oceans. And this just shows a schematic of these, uh, the bluefish, bluefin tuna are they spawn over here in Japan, they hang out over here for a while, and then it takes one to four minutes to come over here to the Pacific uh, or the West Coast. When the control um, fish 
or the yellowfin tuna, which don't leave the west coast or here, and they don't have significant amounts of radioactivity there. And also bluefin tuna that were older than two and a half years, likewise did not have any radioactivity that was present. So this clearly is what came to us directly from Fukushima. Well, a couple weeks ago, there was uh, a gathering uh, on many of the beaches around uh, trying to get attention that Fukushima is here. Um, I paid particular attention to this because I had discovered this about a week or two before when I was told at the uh, uh, United Nations uh, uh, Association here in Santa Barbara, uh, and I had my visceral reaction to that. So. These are the technical safety issues that are uh, present at uh, Fukushima now. The water contamination, which is continuing both from the cooling water, the groundwater, and the ocean water is being contaminated. There is concern about the reactor core meltdown as that molten lava gets, before, gets down below those three reactors. But now I'm going to really come to the part that's of concern, if you're not concerned yet. And that has to do with the spent nuclear fuel that's in the pool storage. So once the fuel is no longer deemed efficient at producing uh, heat to boil water for us, it's put in the spent nuclear fuel pool storage. It's still very radioactive. It's still very hot, and it still has to be cooled, because if it's not cooled, you can still have a nuclear reaction that occurs and the same sort of meltdown process that happens after that. Um, there are many of these uh, pools that are present at Fukushima, but there are also many of these pools which are present at uh, San Onofre and Diablo Canyon. We have succeeded, I shouldn't say we, because I was, had no responsibility for the San Onofre uh, facility being shut down. And we are certainly pleased and glad that that has happened. But all of the fuel rods, in fact, the same number of fuel rods that they have in Unit 4 are in storage on the beach in Southern California. This is what the... Um, uh, um, fuel rods where they are stored and you can see here they are stored closely together uh, like this. This is actually what it looks like in unit 4 on the top of unit 4 and you can see this is nice, neat, organized. This is what it looks like after the fires and the explosions that occurred uh, in unit 4. Usually the pools are 40 feet deep uh, and about 40 feet wide. There's a lot of concrete that's there and these particular pools um, happen to be on the top of the buildings. The amount of uh, spent nuclear fuel in Unit 4 is 14,000 times the amount of explosive at Hiroshima. 14,000 times the amount of explosive at Hiroshima. We all know what Hiroshima was like, or we have a vague idea what Hiroshima was like. It's hard for me to comprehend what 14,000 times that means. But that's the amount of nuclear reactivity that's in the top of Unit 4. Well, this is what Unit 4 looks like. And you can see this is what it looked like soon after uh, the earthquake and tsunami. This is what happened about uh, a year later as they were attempting to repair this. And now this is what it looks like today. And what you can see, this is it right here. And there's this big, huge structure that's right next to it. And there's this covering over here because you can see this is, this is the uh, reactor unit. And this big pool is up on the top of this. It's about 100 feet in the air. And so what they're going to attempt to do is extract these nuclear rods from this pool. Now, these nuclear rods are placed in there very, very tightly, just like cigarettes in a, in a package of cigarettes. So what happens is if you take a, the cigarette carton and you squeeze it, and then you try to pull the cigarette out, they fall apart. There is some concern that that's what's going to happen when these fuel rods, when they're pulled, that they're actually going to break and start a nuclear reaction from there. We don't know what's going to happen, but we have to do something uh, about it. This shows you the schematic of the pool 
And this is water is supposed to have at least 30 feet above the rods as it continues to heat and not cool enough what happens to the water but evaporates. And when it evaporates then the uh, exposed fuel rods are present here which increases the heat which then causes a reaction uh, to occur from there. And this is actually a schematic of one of the reactors. Now I realize this is difficult to uh, sort of follow but Follow me for just a second here. Here is the uh, containment vessel that's around the nuclear reactor. Here is the concrete shell that's around the outside. There's another thick concrete shell around here, and this is probably why there was not uh, a, a huge event, because when the, the cores melted down in units one, two, and three, it was contained in here and went down into the earth. Now, this spent fuel pool, I want you to pay attention to exactly where that's located because there's absolutely no protection around that at all. There is no roof on this building which is blown off. So should an event occur, all of the radioactivity is going to go straight up in the air. And we saw where it went the last time that that occurred. This is happening in the next two weeks. This is a possibility that could happen to each and every one of us. And I can tell you, it wasn't until I started looking into this that I realized this was not, this was a possibility to happen. I certainly haven't taken any preparations for this. I'm not exactly sure what the preparations are, but I think we ought to know so we can at least take whatever preparations we want to take. I may, I may have to make a visit back to Boston during this period of time uh, to protect myself from this. These are the San Onofre uh, nuclear uh, plants, and this just shows you that they have been shut down. Um, I understand that this is actually a wonderful place to go paddle boarding, but I'm not going to try it. Um, and I want to point out that the amount of uh, spent nuclear um, fuel here is about 1,600 tons. That's more that's in that, that, that unit four in Fukushima. And where are these, by the way? Well, they're stored right here on the coast. And you know, we in California have our faults. And those faults, all it takes is earthquake, tsunami, and these areas which are being cooled by water that are there could be disrupted. That's San Diego. This is Diablo Canyon. 90 miles north of here. Again, working well, similar sort of reactor, all it, and the storage uh, areas are out here for the spent nuclear fuel. All it takes, earthquake, tsunami, and we were in a similar situation. And oh, by the way, in case anybody doesn't know, the winds, for those of us who are windsurfers uh, in the past, comes directly down the coast right exactly towards Santa Barbara. We're 90 miles away we are likely going to have to evacuate should that event occur. Well, this is, this is not a, a, just a, an interlude. These uh, moon jellyfish were actually uh, in the news about uh, two weeks ago, and that's because they flooded into the intake valves of a nuclear reactor in Sweden, and they caused, caused the shutdown of the plant. Now, why did that happen? Because water couldn't be brought into the plant and caused cooling to occur. And they had to do an emergency shutdown. Now, you, you think, you know, that's Sweden. I mean, what do those guys know? They just make watches. Um, but what about here? It turns out that about a year ago at Diablo Canyon, these jellyfish uh, called salp did the exact same thing at Diablo Canyon. Uh, and they had to shut down the, go down to about 30% power uh, when these blocked the intake valves and once again had to uh, shut down until they could clean the intake valves out. Well, what do we know about the health risk of uh, radiation therapy? This was a study that was um, supported by the uh, uh, National Research Council of the National Academies where a committee was gathered to assess health risk from exposure to low levels of ionizing radiation. This is available to you online and I wasn't planning on going through it all uh, at this time so I thought I'd just highlight the uh, conclusion was that there is no safe radiation dose. There are doses which appear to be less likely to cause cancer. There are doses above which it is likely you will get cancer. 
There are doses above that that will affect your bone marrow or your gastrointestinal tract. And there are doses above that that will vaporize you immediately. So that's what we know about this powerful radiation that can cause a chain reaction uh, to occur. So what does this really mean and what happens? Well, when you have this powerful radiation, it hits other atoms and frees an electron from that. Any radiation that is strong enough, powerful to do that is called ionizing radiation because that makes a charged particle occur. When you have a charged particle, that is avid to get close to anything that's around it. And it can stick to membranes, it can stick to DNA, it affects rapidly multiplying cells, like in the gastrointestinal tract, like in the bone marrow. So this is what radiation can do. It can do it acutely from an acute exposure, topically, or it can do it chronically if you ingest this through the uh, either through food or fluid. The guys that we worry about are cesium-137, what was in that blue tin tuna? Blue fin tuna? Um, the cesium-137 acts just like potassium. Acts like potassium, it affects the heart, affects the muscles as well. Strontium-90 acts just like calcium, so it goes right to the bones uh, and causes a problem. Iodine-131, this is what we all know about, and you, you hear if there's a nuclear problem, you take that iodine, you take that iodine because our thyroid likes iodine. And so if you take enough iodine, you can block the I-31 from going there and causing thyroid cancer or, or damage to your thyroids. That is true. We don't have any useful anecdotes at this time for cesium or strontium. And you can see the effects can last for decades. This just shows you the relative doses of radiation that can go from being anything from a sunburn to nothing to death. This is what is happening uh, in Japan now. Uh, and this is really screening for external radiation exposure. You can't really uh, screen for internal radiation exposure because our organs soak up a lot of that radiation that's there. So it's not uh, the best way to, to look for how much people have been exposed. What you need to do is w w wear one of those cards, those dosimeter cards, that tells you what you get after you've gotten it. After you've gotten it, it's too late to try and figure out exactly how much you've been exposed to. And since it's odorless, colorless, tasteless, it's really difficult to know if you've been exposed or not. So in summary, Radioactive water continues to leak into the Pacific Ocean. Radioactive materials at Fukushima are an unstable, potentially explosive situation. The potential effect on the water we drink, the air we breathe, and the food we eat are at best speculative. Immediate information and action are necessary as soon as possible. We in Santa Barbara have a front row seat for the unfolding problems with nuclear energy, both at home and abroad. Now, I put this in to remind everyone that it's not good to get caught with your pants down. And so, what do we do in situations like that? We pay attention to what's going on and see what we can learn. This is uh, from Naoto Kan, former Prime Minister of Japan, who was uh, head of Japan when the Fukushima disaster occurred. He uh, clearly had been a strong supporter of nuclear power. Having faced a real accident as Prime Minister and having experienced a situation which came so close to requiring me to order the evacuation of 50 million people, my view has now changed 180 degrees. Although some airplane crashes may claim hundreds of casualties, there are no other events except for wars that would require the evacuations of tens of millions of people. Well, I put this in closing, I put this quote up from uh, Albert Einstein, a foolish Faith and authority is the worst enemy of the truth. I think back on things that have happened um, of the course of uh, my lifetime, and I can remember certainly the Cuban Missile Crisis and how what I have read about that, certainly we were about ready to go to war. And Kennedy and Khrushchev came to an agreement not to do that because neither of them wanted to take responsibility for the deaths of millions and millions of people. The problem we face at Fukushima um, is absolutely huge. It's, inc 
it's formidable. Again, reflecting back uh, on my experiences anyway, I can remember as a child being worried about polio. Well, we now have a vaccine to prevent polio, unless of course you live in Syria and are part of the uh, epidemic that's going on polio there. We had the war in Vietnam that got my attention because I was on my way to Vietnam uh, because I had a low draft number uh, and I clearly was going. I decided to go to medical school instead and that's what kept me from that experience. But that was really my first experience at questioning authority. I'm sure my parents would probably argue with that somewhat, but it was my first real experience with looking at what I thought was people who told the truth and they just weren't telling the truth. And that's when I began to question authority and what people are telling me or what people are not telling me. I came to the AIDS epidemic and I thought, my gosh, look what we've got now. I just wish there was a cure for that. Well, that was about 30 years ago now. And fortunately, we now have something that we call a cure for this because there have been three people who've had transplants who no longer carry HIV in their system. I believe that this can be fought, that we can come together and we can do something about this. And for me, it's a wake-up call. And the wake-up call is really one which goes past, you know, Cottage Hospital or Santa Barbara or California because the implications of what's going on are international. This could happen to us and this could happen to anybody anywhere in terms of the consequences of what's coming our way. So what is it going to take to do something about this? And if it's not you, then who is it going to be? And if it's not right now, then when? Because I think we're facing a crisis. I think it's an absolute crisis. And one of the Chinese letters for crisis is opportunity. And I think this is really our opportunity to come together. You know, we spend a lot of our time being different from other people, different from other nations. This is a, a place where we've got to come together and we've got to get some answers. Reminds me of a few good men. General Jessup on the witness stand. You want answers? Tom Cruise, I'm entitled to answers. You want answers? I'm entitled to the truth. You can't handle the truth. We have to handle the truth, we have to get to the truth, and we have to start right now. So how are you going to do this? Educate yourself. Start being active, start being proactive. We've gotten a Santa Barbara, Barbara protocol for Fu, uh, Fujijima together, which outlines some steps we think are important. It's a place to start, it's a talking point. I, I would hope that every single person in this room takes this and has a conversation with at least three other people. You can start your own reaction if we affect other people that are around us. I don't see any other way this turning around than we do it together. And we've got to do it together because that's where the power comes from when we're all one. Thank you all.